So uh, welcome everyone to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, General Thoracic Surgery Database Neoadjuvant Therapy Module Webinar. Today is Tuesday. It's today Tuesday. Yes, October. Uh, I'm sorry. No, today's Monday, October 23rd of 2023. So sorry about that. Um, so again, welcome everyone um, to today's webinar. Um, just really quickly for the agenda for today, um, I am going to introduce our two speakers. We have uh, Dr. Chris Cedar. Um, our GTSD task force chair, as well as Dr. Stephen Broderick from Johns Hopkins. Um, they will be presenting today on the neoadjuvant therapy module for the general thoracic surgery database. And we also have um, Ruth Riley on the call as well. She is our GTSD clinical consultant, and she will be providing a case scenario um, today for the module. Um, also on the call today, we have uh, Carol Crone um, assisting as well. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, with that, I am going to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Cedar um, for today's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Cedar. Hi, everyone. I appreciate uh, everyone getting on today. Um, you know, as uh, we have, you know, seen with a lot of new trials in the last couple of years, um, people and participants and multi-institutional teams are increasingly using um, neoadjuvant immunotherapy and neoadjuvant targeted therapies. And um, that's, you know, from, you know, what used to be considered, er you know, early stage disease, stage 1B disease, um, all the way up to stage 3 patients. And uh, um, with that, you know, we're always trying to remain as relevant as we possibly can. And we're trying to create, collect as important of information, as useful information as, as we can. Um, so we uh, implemented two different kind of simultaneous strategies to collect data on um, neoadjuvant immunotherapy and targeted therapy. And one is quite simple. That's the STS temporary fields. Um, we had two temporary fields in the data collection form. Um, one was a yes, no field, and the other one was a fill in the blank field. And we um, collectively agreed at a leadership level that collect collecting using the yes no field for did the patient for the question did the patient receive neoadjuvant immunotherapy or targeted therapy yes or no and for the fill in the blank question fill in the blank field that we could use um, the question that we're including in the DCF is which agents were used. Um, and this, this change to the DCF is um, currently active, and it's available for all cases uh, with a surgical date of October 1st or later. So as you're collecting your October cases, if you see that a patient had induction chemo, I'm sorry, induction, neo, induction uh, uh, immunotherapy or targeted agents, you'd want to fill that out. Um, now, one of the we figured there would be a number of questions surrounding that, um, and so of course we've updated the training manual to um, you know explain exactly what we are um, asking for here, and we've also to so that's number one. Um, number two, in order to create to collect more granular data on these patients we've created a red cap module, and um, there is precedent for this. This is not a um, this is not a new uh, um, concept. The uh, adult cardiac surgery database, many of you may know, uh, collect, has red, a, red, a number, a couple different red cap databases, which uh, collect you know, more detailed information on, on various topics. Um, so the red cap database that we have uh, put together um, was primarily led by Dr. Broderick, uh, who's on the, uh, on the meeting with us, uh, and I. It includes 13 questions, um, and we can go through it super quickly here, and then we're going to do a, um, you know, a test case so everybody has an idea of, you know, what it might look like, and then we'll field as many questions as, uh, as we're able to, um, but it should take probably less than 10 minutes to, you know, for a, a data manager to complete. Um, and this will be active and available for cases with a surgical date of November 1st or later. So um, you can currently use the temporary fields, you know, but the REDCap database will not be available for cases until uh, surgical dates of November 1st. The long-term vision here is, you know, that um, we should be able to fairly quickly demonstrate 
how often preoperative immunotherapy and targeted therapy is being used, um, for whom, and uh, potentially associated with some short-term outcomes that we collect. Um, the longer-term vision is once we demonstrate um, that we have this basic data, it will be very it will be um, of interest not only for research purposes, um, but also potentially to industry um, that we can collaborate with the industry to. Um, you know, perhaps benefit the the database and the participants in the database. So, Leanne, if you'd um pull up the the red cap module, um, yes, sir. I'll pull the lab side over. So, um, Stephen, do you want to go through the module uh, quickly, or would you rather uh, me take a look or to talk through it? But why don't you talk through it, and, and I'll add some commentary here and there. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, when you when you so there's not a direct link from your um, you know vendor software to this red cap module. Uh, there is a uh, a link that's in the training manual that once you you know click on the on the field, um, the patient got neoadjuvant immunotherapy or targeted therapy. Um, you know we encourage everyone to then go to this. Oh, could you go back one? Oh, uh, sorry. Yes. Yep. Um, thanks, Leanne. Uh, we'd encourage everybody to then click on this REDCap database, and it will take you to this screen right here. Okay. And this is a fairly straightforward, um, pretty quick thing here. So you're going to um, put in your participant ID, um, the patient ID, uh, the record ID, and date of surgery. And these <clears throat> fields right here, these first four fields are simply to link this record in the REDCap database back to the patient so that we can associate, you know, let's what I, it'd say immunotherapy with, um, with short-term outcomes or demographics or however we want to associate it. So you enter your information like this and you've now linked back to a patient. Uh, next there. And then you've got these 13 questions, okay? Um, and these are all questions related to um, immunotherapy or um, targeted molecular therapy. Um, the first is PDL1. And Ruth is going to go through a, um, a presentation in just a little bit that explains um, some of the finer details of what PDL1 is. Um, but it uh, essentially will be a value uh, from, one, from 0 to 100. Uh, that is reported in your pathology reports. And you'll see that in the case that we're going to do in just a little bit. Um, next, was molecular testing performed prior to the initiation of therapy? Uh, yes or no? And so this is, there's a number of different companies that, and, and also um, there's a number of cores that, uh, or, or basically um, labs that do it within institutions. And so if a patient had molecular testing performed um, or molecular sequencing performed, uh, you would click, click yes here. And so if you click yes, um, it asks which gene mutations were identified, okay? And so there are a number of the most common, um, potentially actionable mutations here. Um, you may or may not have heard of some of these. The most common ones are EGFR and ELK, KRAS. And then RAT and ROS are a little bit less common, but um, these are these are mutations that we um, you know can potentially uh, act upon with neoadjuvant therapies. Uh, so next questions: If so, you're filling this out because the patient got a neoadjuvant um, therapy and a neoadjuvant immunotherapy or targeted uh, molecular therapy, and so. Sometimes there's a number of different um, uh, of regimens that patients can get beforehand for for uh, um, lung cancer. Some of them might be immunotherapy alone. Somebody, some of them may be targeted therapy alone, and some may be chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. And as time goes on, there's going to be more and more and more studies come out. There's going to be more and more um, uh, uh, potential regimens. Here and the the nice thing about these red cap databases is that 
we can change, you know, unlike the DCF, which we can only change, you know, once every three years, let's say, or whatever it may be, um, these red cap database forms can be changed, you know, regularly, and we can update the training manual regular regularly, so that we have truly like up to date and current um, options here based on the most recent trial data. Um, so you okay, let's say let's pick a chemotherapy and immunotherapy. That's um, uh, one of the more common induction therapy uh, regimens that people are currently getting. And then if you click that, it uh, it pulls up chemotherapy plus immunotherapy used. If you were to pick just immunotherapy, it's a different list or just targeted therapy, it's a different list. You can see, um, and so that all changes depending on what you pick, but let's just pick um, a, a chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So then you would go here um, and let's say the patient got uh, nivolumab plus paclitaxel plus carboplatin. That's a pretty common, um, and you may notice that there are a couple of things. There, we're going to change this just a little. We're going to change this just a little bit. Um, but um, say you pick that one. Um, that that is the neoadjuvant immunotherapy that the patient got. Okay, the nivolumab is the immunotherapy, and the paclitaxel and the carboplatin are the chemotherapy agents. Um, and then, you know, it, it varies in the number of cycles that patients uh, complete. So, you know, most commonly patients are going to get three or four cycles. Um, and so let's say this patient gets two cycles, okay, um, because they had a complication or they didn't feel great or they couldn't tolerate their chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Um, you know, you'd basically try to tease out, did the patient complete their prescribed treatment? And that would likely be documented in your uh, medical oncologist's notes. And let's say that this patient did not. Okay, so we'd, we'd click on that. Um, it's just a yes, no. And then, um, you know, ultimately, the reason that you're filling this form out is because the patient made it to surgery. Uh, so you would click on time and you'd, you'd click on this one and it's going to give you the um, time there. You're going to enter the time in days from the last uh, chemotherapy treatment or immunotherapy treatment or targeted molecular treatment uh, to the day of surgery. Okay. And it, it's specified in the, um, in the training manual that day one is the day after. So day zero is the last day of treatment. Day one is uh, the next day. Day two is the following day. And then whatever day the um, the surgery lands on is the day that you would record here. But that's all specified in the training manual, so everybody has it. Um, and then pathologic complete response to resection. So this is what you're going to find in your um, in your uh, pathology report. And we're going to make a couple little tweaks to this as well before it goes live, um, based on some beta testing and some feedback from some different people, but. The idea here is, um, you know, how much of a response did patients uh, have? And it's going to be less than basically none, less than 10 percent partial, which is going to be 11 to uh, 89, 11 to 90 percent. And then um, then we're going to change the next one from 91 to 99 percent. And the following and the last one is a complete pathologic response, which is 100 percent. Um, and then finally, the last question was neoadjuvant or was adjuvant therapy given? This can be yes, no. If we pick yes on this, uh, it just gives you some options of uh, specify the adjuvant therapy given. If you were to say say the patient didn't get either of these um, adjuvant therapies and you click on other because they got something else. Oh, sorry. No problem. If other, please specify what. So um, in all of the other all of the other fields like specific chemotherapy and immunotherapy used. Um, if you if you click on that, Leanne, uh, the nivolumab plus paclitaxel plus carboplatin um, right there, yep. So if you click on other there because they got something else, uh, it would give you opportunity to enter a free text. And then that's it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something new, it's something different. Uh, hopefully some, you know, this will kind of encourage people to, um, you know, learn a little bit about this because it is really probably the future of a lot of what we do in thoracic surgery. Um, Dr. Broderick is uh, one of the kind of nation's experts on uh, immunotherapies and 
and its uh, use in in induction uh, matter manner. And so, you know, I um, recruited him as uh, you know to to help me out with this. And um, I'm not sure if he has anything to add here. Yeah, I, you know, Chris, I would just add that um, the the big picture thing here is that but how we treat lung cancers that we have considered resectable for years um, is changing dramatically. It has changed in the last couple of years and will continue to over the next few years. Um, the idea being that even if we resect the tumor and any cancer that's in the lymph nodes, more often than not, those tumors come back and the recurrence rates are just too high and getting better systemic control of cancer um, seems to be effective um, and necessary. And so that's kind of the impetus or that was the impetus to moving these novel therapeutics into the preoperative setting and it's been working. So we have a lot of early phase data and now a couple of prospective randomized trials that have shown the benefit of these agents. Um, and, you know, as, as a, a surgeon and a researcher and a database participant, um, I'm, I'm, I, I feel for adding complexity to the database and adding variables and things. Um, but this is going to be really, really important data um, for, I think the whole lung cancer community, even beyond um, thoracic surgeons. And at the moment, all we have really is trial data. And so this would be kind of the first foray into what's actually being done in the real world um, as standard of care therapy for lung cancer patients. So uh, thanks for everybody that's been, been working on it. Um, we could go into so much, we could really get in the weeds of a million variables here, but we've really tried to sort of streamline this to get a snapshot of, of what's going on out there. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, we'll be participating. Um, you know, I think it remains to be seen how, what the uptake is going to be like out there. Um, you know, we're, we're a busy center. And I can tell you that, that we um, administered neoadjuvant chemo immunotherapy and then operated um, like 23 times in the last year. So it, it's not going to be a huge lift or a huge volume of cases to abstract. The still the, by far and away, the, the number one thing that we'll be doing as lung cancer surgeons and you all would be abstracting as data abstractors or data managers is going to be the routine stage one lung cancer wedge segment lobe. Um, and this will probably be um, on, on the order of, of maybe five or 10% of the cases that you abstract. Yeah. You know, the one thing I do, um, I, I know that there's a number of questions coming in, in the chat and, um, I know Ruth is going to address a number of these and, and we'll, uh, jump in as well. But the one thing I do want to, um, kind of mention or emphasize, um, is that this is voluntary. You know, we're not, we're not, um, nobody's going to be penalized if they don't do it. In fact, um, uh, you know, it, it's completely up to you and your surgeons whether or not um, you'd like to do it. However, uh, you know, we don't think it's too heavy of a lift and we think that this is really important information and is going to make our database that much better. So we are kind of um, asking and pleading uh, that uh, people do um, participate in this. And when they have one, a case come by um, that had induction, neoadjuvant, um, chemotherapy and immunotherapy or immunotherapy or target molecular therapy that that you that you uh, do fill this out. Um, there were uh, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, and this is not the completed uh, database form. This is not the completed red cap form. Um, we are adding one additional question that is what's preoperative invasive mediastinal staging performed. And it, if yes, uh, who performed it, pulmonary, thoracic, or both? Um, and so that will be in, in here as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and that, I think that's a, a pretty good start. Now, I know Ruth has got a lot of things that she'd like to go through, and we're going to do a case here. So um, I think more questions will come up, but uh, do you want to take it from here, Ruth? Sure. 
So we're going to do a case scenario, but before we jump into the case scenario, I just wanted to give a little bit of background education on some of the terms and definitions that are used in the Red Cap um, optional neoadjuvant therapy module. Um, and probably it would be helpful to start by defining what neoadjuvant really is. So neoadjuvant means, um, well, I don't know. I'm sure Dr. Cedar or Dr. Broderick probably actually know the like Latin definition of these terms, but it's before your patient has surgery, right? So pre-surgical is the neoadjuvant treatment. Adjuvant treatment is uh, chemotherapy or radiation that's given after the patient's resection occurs. So the initial, um, the initial question to ask yourself as you're looking at these cases is if your patient is having surgery and they didn't have any chemotherapy or radiation for their lung cancer before this, before the surgery, you're not going to fill out this module. Okay, so hopping into drive. Oh, can, yeah. can I just throw in the other word is induction, right? Yes, it's a yes. little less, little less scientific, but people throw that one around a lot where they say induction chemo immunotherapy. That's the same thing as neoadjuvant. Yes, thank you. And we are going to call out some of those terms in parentheses on the red cap form. So when you see the final version published, um, it'll be uh, better defined for you in the form. So hopefully a little bit less confusing. Um, so what are driver mutations? Uh, driver mutations are genetic changes that drive the development and progression of lung cancer. Um, Dr. Cedar talked through some of these really therapies that target driver mutations, improve survival and quality of life of lung cancer patients which is why uh, physicians uh, such as Dr. Cedar and Broderick are so interested in this data um, to see how ultimately we can improve survival and quality of life for the patients that we take care of. If you wanna hop to the next slide, Leanne. These are just graphic representations of comic driver mutations in lung cancer. Uh, on the left, driver mutations in adenocarcinoma are represented and on the right, squamous cell lung cancers. Um, there are two links at the bottom. The first link uh, links to the article that I took these graphs from. The second um, article is actually really interesting. I had a great time reading it. If you can have a great time reading an article in nature, um, that's the one. So uh, if you're looking for more information, uh, take a read there. It's really interesting. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, common targeted therapies are the IBS and the MABs. Um, there are two basic types, small molecule drugs and monoclonal antibodies. Um, the monoclonal antibodies are the MABs. The small molecule drugs are the IBs. And then on the next couple of slides, I'm not going to read through all of these, but these are just a list of common targeted therapies. There's actually a link that I added to the training manual in October uh, under the, the uh, temporary text field, sequence 4620. It's a link to the SEER um, RX interactive drug database. And you can put in whatever drug it is that your patient got preoperatively, and it'll tell you whether it is or is not a targeted therapy. So it's really helpful. And it's already linked in the training manual under sequence 4620. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, programmed cell death ligand 1, aka PDL1. So, PDL1 is a protein that plays a role in the body's immune system. It binds to another protein called PD1. When this happens, the two proteins block the immune system from killing cancer cells. So, you can see the PDL1 protein sitting on the surface of that big, globby, angry looking cancer cell attaching to the PD1 protein on the surface of that poor, sad uh, T cell. Um, preventing it from killing the cancer cell as it wishes that it truly could. If you go to the next slide, this is just a different uh, graphic representation on the left of exactly, uh, you know, the, the tumor cell is sitting there with its PDL1 protein and PD1 protein on the T cell that are able to interact. On the right hand side, you can see that immunotherapy has been used, the, the um, protein, the, the uh, site on that protein has been interacted with, and now the tumor cell can be killed as planned by that T cell um, because the immunotherapy uh, has done its job. If you want to go to the next slide, these are just some common immunotherapies. They also end in MAB uh, very commonly, so a little bit confusing um, perhaps at times um, with some of those targeted therapies. But again, if you go to that SEER um, database, you can always type in any drug that's been given and it'll tell you exactly what family it fits in. Um, okay, so this is the case scenario. Um, 
So the this is a surgeon's HMP note. I copied and uh, pasted parts of this, including the uh, dictation errors. So there's a few missing words here and there. Um, so the patient's a 54-year-old female. She has some comorbidities, just quit smoking two weeks ago. Uh, she has a clinical stage 2B. Um, and then my uh, surgeons are my best friends. They always give me my clinical stage in parentheses. So a CT3, CN0, M0 tumor. Um, and then you can see in the dictated note that um, the patient is status post neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy per Checkmate 816 protocol. And then, however, she received only one cycle of nilu nivolumab, nivolumab due to immunotherapy-related rash after cycle one. The rest of the notes superfluous. We can skip that part and then go on to the next note. Oh, uh, well, this is the pre-op pathology report. So the way that the pathology reports appear in my system, and actually radiology notes as well, the addendums populate to the top of the report. So actually the patients, the first part of the pathology came back is at the bottom always. So the final diagnosis, lung squamous cell carcinoma, you can see that that resulted on June 6th. And then we waited almost 20 days for um, the EGFR L commutation testing to come back. And you can see that both of those were negative. And then we waited almost an additional week for the second addendum to occur. So the patient's uh, tissue was sent out to Mayo and it came back. The patient had no 0% um, tumor cells positive for pdl one and the pathology report. And you'll learn after you look at enough of these, there's sort of a standard turnaround time from your pathology department, just based on how the processes go when they outsource labs or do it in-house. Like you can sort of guess about how long you're gonna wait for um, all the information that you need to come back. If you want to go to the next slide, I think this is my medical oncology progress note. My medical oncologists, also my best friends, they always do this beautiful thing where in their impression, they keep track of the dates for every super significant thing that happens for patients. So the date that the testing comes back, they keep track of cycle dates. They keep track of what was given at each cycle. And then there's always a sort of like a hashtag out impression with different things that happen. And in this case, the patient... Um, developed this rash after uh, cycle one. Um, and so for cycle two did not get the, I can't say it, I give up the, the nivolumab. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. It's one of those words you like read it and then you just can't say it. <laughs> okay, uh, Leanne, do you wanna go to the, um, the live? the live yes, version of the form and then we can abstract it together. I put it in here in a screenshot just so that if people go back and reference my case scenario, they would have a survey response to sort of yeah. reference as well. I'm gonna put in just some test and yeah. for, uh, and you need to put today yeah. today. Yeah. All right. Okay, so PDL one percent um, so my patient had 0% PDL1. You'll recall it was the second addendum to that uh, pathology report. It's always reported in a whole number of percent. Was molecular testing performed prior to initiation of therapy? Yes, it was. If you go back to my medical oncology note, um, you will see in that beautiful list um, that the testing resulted before cycle one of the chemoimmunotherapy was initiated. The next question is, if so, were mutations in any of the following genes identified? We're adding an option here that's going to be no or none, because in the instance of my patient that I abstracted, you'll see on my demo slide where I screenshot this, I had to leave it blank because they didn't have an EGFR or an ALK mutation. We didn't test for ROS1 or KRAS or any of the others. And so um, I had to leave it blank, but really the answer would be no. Select neoadjuvant therapy administered. So my patient started with chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So that was the option that I selected. And then, um, I can't believe I have to say this again, but they got <laughs> nivolumab, paclitaxel, and carboplatin, which we're going to change to just nivolumab plus platinum doublet because the paclitaxel carboplatin is a platinum doublet. So we're going to get rid of that duplication. So I would um, select nivolumab plus platinum doublet in the final version of this database. 
number of cycles completed. So here's where it get a, got a little bit tricky for my patient. I wasn't quite sure what to answer and actually confirmed it with Dr. Broderick and Cedar before this call. Ultimately, we're gonna select one cycle was completed because the patient only completed one cycle of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. The additional two cycles were only chemotherapy. And then we're gonna say that the patient did not complete prescribed treatment because they did not complete three or the original plan was for three cycles of chemo immunotherapy. And they only were able to complete the one secondary to the presence of that rash. Time and days from last treatment to surgery. If you go back and do the counting, it's 44 days. Um, remember the day that your patient received the last cycle of, um, well, maybe I did this now that I'm just thinking about this. Sorry, this is new, you all. Should I have counted? So I counted from the last day of cycle three. Should I have counted from the last day of the chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, or should I have counted from cycle I, three? I think, I mean, uh, Stephen, let me know what you think, but I was thinking that probably the end of any induction therapy. Uh, I think that's right. Okay, yeah. I'll so define it that way in the training manual. Yeah, clarify that in the training manuals. Okay, so I did, I counted it right. So 44 days is counting that le the cycle three day was day zero and then counting one and then the day of surgery is day 44. Um, pathological, pathologic response upon resection. I didn't have the pathology report available um, to share with you all, so um, I didn't. I didn't demonstrate this one. And then the patient did not receive adjuvant therapy in this instance, um, which is uh, therapy after resection. So then you would just go ahead and submit that. It won't let you because we didn't. You have, probably have to fill in that blank one. Yep. But um, we'll get that. And, and so we'll, you want to add those options. We will make it so that um, if one is, you know, left blank, that you're 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 able to still submit the data that you have, or there's an option for that. Right, we're at add unknown. <clears throat> yeah, we are adding unknown to several of these fields. We recognize that that's uh, a gap currently. Um, so, do we want to work through some of these questions and answers, or do you have another let's, comment? Let's do that, uh, Ruth. Do you want to? Um, uh, go ahead and start working through the questions and then, yeah. um, you know, feel free to answer any that you, uh, you know, are comfortable with and otherwise, mm -hmm. um, you know, we can try to help out as needed. Yep. So the first question is the link to the REDCap database in the GTSD uh, training manual. It is not yet in the training manual. The intent is to start with patients with a surgical date of November 1st, 2023. Um, and as you can see, we are still working on finalizing the uh, questions in the REDCap database. So the link is not there yet, but it will be available in the November training manual when that is published. Um, and there will also be um, like FAQs uh, available in the training manual for the REDCap um, fields, I guess, for lack of a yeah. better term. And also, Ruth, um, STS does plan to send a formal communication out to the participants once the REDCap module goes live. So the link will be there as well as within the training manual. Perfect, thank you. The next question, can we ask our vendors to create these fields in our databases so it can be included in the patient's abstract instead of duplicating some of the data? Does the STS plan to work with vendors to have these fields added permanently so we don't have to do both? Dr. Cedar, do you wanna take that or? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the the question there. Can, what, what, what exactly are we? Instead of having a red cap, they would like this the fields added to the database. Oh yeah, so that will likely eventually happen. Um, however, we you know can only we're only revising the data collection form. Um, you know, it's you typically up to this point had been every three years, um, but we don't have a current revision planned. Um, there's a number of things on the you know STS um, analytics. Uh, end of it. And uh, the database update is not one of them for thoracic and at least in the next year or two. So um, until we revise the data collection form, um, then the answer is basically no. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is the difference between sequence 650, history of cancer, preoperative chemo immunotherapy, and this neoadjuvant therapy temporary fields? Are we capturing both sequence 650 and this? 
Yes. So sequence 650, when they ask whether your patient had preoperative chemo or immunotherapy, it's asking about any chemo or immunotherapy ever in the history of the patient's life for any disease. These sequences or these fields, I guess, these temporary fields are very specifically asking about the disease being treated in the surgical resection. And if the patient had um, preoperative immuno or targeted therapy for um, this disease being resected, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's a circum there's a situation where a patient just gets in, um, let's say preoperative chemotherapy. The answer would be yes to 650, but you would not fill out yes for this targeted uh, molecular therapy or immunotherapy module. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Sarah shared in the Q&A the link to the SEER RX tool. Um, it is also in the training manual, but if you want to copy and paste it from the Q&A, you can do that as well and save it as a favorite. Um, there's a question about the difference between adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy. I think we covered that, but if you are at all confused about adjuvant, neoadjuvant, um, please reach out. I'm happy to help you uh, if you have like a specific example you want to talk through because it's super important uh, all the way across the database that uh, you have a firm understanding of that concept. Uh, what if not all the information is available to data managers? Can fields be left blank? So like, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, as far as uh, fields being left blank, you, the, the red cap form will not allow you to, to close it if it's blank, but we are adjusting it so that when there's a potential unknown, um, you can, you can fill that in. So, um, you know, there were, that will, that won't be, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, will each site be able to query their own red cap data based on site ID? How would we go about getting access to the raw data in the in this red cap database? I assume the question is, how do we get our own and how do we get everybody else's? Oh, that's a that's a really good question and not one that I'd thought of to be completely honest. Um, once we, you know, of course, this is all your own data and just like your institutional STS data, um, you know, you have access to all of the all of it. Um, and we, you know, we would find a way to make sure you could get your own data back. And, um, you know, and I, 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 I guess that'd be a question for Robert, probably at the analytics center to, to let us know how, you know, the mechanism to do that. But, um, but be assured if you're entering any data from your own institution, that's your data and you uh, will be able to get that data back. Um, the next question is similar, but has an additional question. Will we be able to go back and make edits in case of data entry error? Will sites be able to see their forms once submitted? Hmm. Um, so we but... had talked about this, Dr. Cedar, um, internally. Um, so if um, for data entry errors, if a site needs to, um, and Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, because I believe this is what um, adult cardiac um, does as well, but if you have a data entry error and if you need to re-enter it with updating information, um, in terms of duplicates, um, we will delete any prior entry and just take the last one that was entered. Yep, that's right, Leanne. And if there's other data, yeah, I, that's right. I would just say updated and we'll take the, the last one. That's what um, Nikki has confirmed in the research center. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Um, is this only done for clinical stage 1B and higher non-small cell lung cancer or all stages of lung cancer? Well, as of, all the trial data. Sorry. Yeah, as of right now, um, I don't know that anyone is treating stage one with neoadjuvant, I'm sorry, stage 1A uh, lung cancers with neoadjuvant immunotherapy or targeted molecular therapy. Now that time may come in the future. Um, however, as of right now, it should be 1B and higher based on all data that we have. Can REDCap calculate the days if we put in the date that it was ended? There's a couple of people that have suggested that. I don't know if that's been looked at already. Like if you put your last day and yeah so they don't have to count the day it seems like that's a question for nikki and one that um is a great suggestion i mean if we could just 
you know, enter last day of uh, induction therapy and enter. The surgical date's already collected on the first page, so. Yeah, yeah, that seems like that should be able to be um, calculated. I, I bet that can be. Yeah, we'll ask, we'll put that on the list. We'll ask Nikki about that. Good suggestion. If a patient has chemotherapy only, are they being entered in the red cat? No. Mm -mm. No, this is specifically for immunotherapy and um, and targeted molecular therapies. Can we have a copy of the presentation to help for education purposes? Leanne, will this be posted where the usual webinars are posted? Yes. Yes. It'll be posted out on the um, webinars page in STS YouTube channel. To confirm, we are duplicating the agent used in STS database temp text field 4620 and in the red cap database. So 4620 is if the patient received induction, immunotherapy, or a targeted agent directed at the lung cancer of interest, what agent? Which one? Yep. Yeah. I mean, and um, you know, the idea in rolling these out simultaneously is um you know, we believe that, you know, if it's in the DCF and we have this, that, that people are more likely to fill out two questions in the DCF than, than this module. However, um, we're hoping that the two questions in the DCF will spur people to then go on and fill out the module to give us more granular data. As you can see, you know, we collect quite a bit more um, information in the, in, in the uh, red cat module. So there's two questions that sort of um, relate, I guess. What's the difference between chemotherapy and targeted therapy? And is EGFR ALK what you're referring to when asking for molecular testing or is molecular testing the diagnosis of the type of cancer? So two sort of technical questions. Uh, Stephen, do you want to take that or? Yeah, so the, the, the latter, uh question first. Molecular testing is, is testing for the specific genes or gene mutations that we know are associated with the development of these cancers. So that um, for the so the purposes of this module are going to be EGFR, the two different, the two most common EGFR mutations, ALK rearrangements, um, KRAS, ROS1, uh, and I think we have RET in there. Um, those are sort of widely termed um, um, molecular data, next-gen sequencing, or mutation profiling. Um, I think the other thing that you're sort of referring to are, are some of the staining that's done, the immunohistochemistry that's done to determine what type of cancer it is. That's a different thing. And, and it'll vary a little bit from center to center, kind of how things are reported, but usually the mutation data or the sequencing data is reported out as a separate lab field or a separate addendum to the pathology report where they talk about sequencing or mutation data. Um, and then I think that the other question was kind of what's the difference between um, chemotherapy and molecular targeted therapy? And so kind of the difference there is that that broadly speaking, chemotherapy is, is a, a modality or, or a group of drugs that, that really just kill all rapidly dividing cells like cancers are, whereas the molecular targeted therapies are drugs that were developed to specifically go after the, the mutations that result in the tumors forming. So for example, if someone has an EGFR mutation that led to them developing an EGFR mutated adenocarcinoma, um, I'll say we, it wasn't me or, or Chris, it was a lot, it was really smart scientists and medical oncologists who have developed these drugs that bind to the protein products of those mutated genes and essentially shut that, that tumor cell off and make it die. Uh, so that's the difference between a molecular targeted therapy. And I think we'll be able to provide a list of drugs that are molecular targeted therapies drugs that are immunotherapies, and then also which drugs are just sort of regular chemotherapy. Um, okay, the red cap entry in cardiac doesn't allow you to see what you entered once you submit the info. Is there a way this red cap can allow a review of the info entered to confirm it was entered correctly? 
Well, you know, I would say since it's one form, you know, it's not like you have multiple pages that you kind of review. Since it's just one page, I mean, I think the best you'll be able to do is probably just look over that page before you hit submit. Perfect. And then the next question, so are the added sequences, temporary fields, still only referring to immunotherapy and targeted therapy with the red cap data collection, including the chemotherapies as well? Yes, the temporary fields are, in order to click yes for the yes, no temporary field, um, was targeted molecular therapy or immunotherapy um, administered, the patient has to have had targeted molecular therapy or immunotherapy. Um, the patient, if the patient just had chemotherapy, the answer would be no to that. Um, I believe that's, hopefully that's answering the question. Well, similarly though, in the red cap, if your patient only had chemotherapy, they wouldn't be entered there either. You wouldn't uh, be filling out that module. Yeah. So it, really both of them are looking at the same thing. It's just mm, reported differently, trying to get at more specificity, I guess, is maybe a way or a different way to group and bucket the data. Um, there's a vendor specific question in the Q&A and I don't know if Carol or Leanne wanna answer that one and, and um, if you wanna mm -hmm. type that one, cause I think probably it doesn't apply to most of the group. Yeah. Um, they're just asking if they should move the temp fields to another section that isn't at the very bottom of the form. Um, unfortunately, I've never, I haven't seen the vendor software, so I don't know how they, well, I yeah, assume it's I just, think, yeah, I don't know. I think what they're asking is if we want this within a specific section on section. the data collection form, mm -hmm. they can move it to that section. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have where does it live now in our data collection form? It's at the very end. It's at the end. These yeah. Yeah. These temp okay. fields, they're at the very end. Okay. Then it can just, I guess it could stay there. Thank you, Emmanuel, for asking. Yeah. All I think right. That's all the questions. Anything else? Well, I appreciate everybody getting on and, uh, you know, listening to this. Um, you know, I think this is some pretty new and exciting information we're going to be collecting here. Um, I really encourage everyone to do it. There may be some growing pains, um, but we'll be right there alongside of you to try to, you know, smooth any questions and address things that, um, you know, maybe aren't perfect from the outset. But, um, you know, this will be incrementally built to, um, you know, make it as, you know, good as possible over time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And for any questions related to these fields for the um, red cap or and or the temporary fields, um, just use the clinical support um, link here for the um, clinical question request form. Um, Ruth will be um, handling those and we'll um, update the training manual as as we go throughout this process, you know, make additional clarifications. So um, it'll be just like, you know, the other variables that we collect, any updates and clarifications will be um, handled in the training manual. And then we'll educate as usual, you know, per our monthly webinar. So, um, so just be sure and, and submit those questions via the request form. Um, all right. Well, I'm not seeing any additional questions come in. Um, thank you, Dr. Cedar, Dr. Broderick. Thank you very much um, for being on today and um, educating the data managers about the, the form and the temporary fields. We appreciate you uh, very much for taking time out of your day to, to educate and um, inform us about the, um, the module. We're super excited. And again, just a reminder to everyone, um, STS will be sending out a formal communication um, regarding the go live of this form. Um, we do have some tweaks to make and we'll take back feedback from this webinar today. Um, and internally, we'll continue to um, to tighten up the form and um, get things ready to go for for our go live. So thank you, everyone, for joining today. Ruth, thank you so much for your education. Um, we appreciate you. And 
Um, with that, um, just a quick reminder, we do have two upcoming webinars. So our um, new data manager webinar is scheduled for this week. So we do have two uh, webinars this week. Um, so we all, our next new data manager webinar will be on <clears throat> Wednesday the 25th at 2 Central. And then we'll follow up with our next monthly webinar scheduled for uh, November the 8th at 1.30 Central. So thank you everyone for um, joining today. And again, thank you, Dr. Cedar, Dr. Broderick, and Ruth for, um, for your education and for being on today. I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Thank you sir. very much.